Perfect. Thank you very much. My name is Savan Kapal. I'm a professor of neurodegenerative disorders and clinical trials at the University of Edinburgh. And it's a fantastic opportunity to be here to speak to you today and share our experiences of delivering a phase three platform trial in the United Kingdom for people with MND. So our trial is called MND Smart. And really MND Smart is a UK wide interdisciplinary effort that we've created in partnership with experts in MND disease biology, uh, in stem cell based drug discovery, also in innovative trial met methodology, working with statisticians from uh, expertise in cancer and infectious diseases, and crucially also designed in partnership and collaboration uh, with people living with MND ALS. So motor neuron disease you as an audience don't need me to introduce to you uh, how difficult this condition is. Um, it's a rapidly progressive uh, and a condition that ultimately is fatal. And people present in many different ways, often with weakness of the arms and legs, difficulties with speaking and swallowing, and, and unfortunately also respiratory failure. We also understand that up to half of people with this condition have cognitive and behavior change, and 15% of people will have a diagnosis of frank dementia. One of the key understandings now of motor neuron disease ALS is that the underlying pathology is mostly due to TDP43 pathology, and that allows a target for treatment and also potentially a biomarker for following people up in trials. One of the difficulties in trialing uh, in clinical trials for motor neuron disease is that it's a difficult diagnosis to make. In the UK, it takes us approximately one year to make a definitive diagnosis of motor neuron disease. And thereafter, the average survival is only 18 months to three years, and one in three people will die within one year. Despite this, it's a relatively common disorder compared to other neurological disorders. One in 300 people will have motor neuron disease. Now, there's only one licensed treatment globally, Riluzol, that was approved in 1995. And this drug only extends life by two to three months. And so there have been over 125 trials in the last decade that have failed to identify alternative treatments. And so we took the approach that there was an urgent need for improved participation of people with motor neuron disease in clinical trials, a requirement to innovate in how we select drugs, and also innovation in clinical trial design. And I've listed here some of the uh, factors that have led to difficulties in historical clinical trials. I've mentioned that this disease is rapidly progressive, it's disabling. That means that people have difficulties attending appointments, coming to clinic. Uh, it also means there's a lot of attrition due to side effects, people drop out of trials. There are also a lack of sensitive and specific biomarkers for detecting if a drug is working or not. And we also know that in, the, in historical trials, they've failed to follow up enough people for enough duration of time. So there have been underpowered studies that have led to the same drug being tested again and again because there hasn't been a definitive result. So if you imagine historical trials being typical two arm studies, one placebo arm and one active drug treatment. If you want to test four drugs and you want to see if any of them work, you have to identify which drug you're going to test. You have to get regulatory approvals. You have to get funding. You have to then find sites that will participate in the trial, recruit participants, follow them up, report on the data, uh, and then publish the data. In inevitably, it will be a negative result. That whole process takes four to five years. And if you're testing drugs simultaneously, one after the other, to test four drugs will take a minimum of 16 years to test. That's obviously not good enough for a condition as quickly progressing as motor neuron disease. And so what is possible is to test medicines simultaneously using a multi-arm trial design. So you can test candidate medicines uh, in, in simultaneous multi-arm, multi-stage platform. And you can also then have an adaptive trial design that allows you to look at all of the accumulating data and make decisions about whether to stop a drug or indeed to introduce new drugs into this platform. And in that way, you can test many, many more drugs in a shorter duration of time. So this is the approach we've taken with MND Smart. So this is a, a definitive phase three MND trial. We launched in February, 2020, just before the global pandemic. And at that point, we started a three arm study. We, we were testing placebo, uh, intervention one, memantine, and intervention two, trazodone. 
We completed our stage one interim analysis last Mar in March 2022, and that was when 50 participants had completed six months or more in each arm of the study. And at that point, we looked at change in ALS FRS, the clinical rating scale for people with ALS. We are uh, we launched a fourth drug, a fourth arm in April 2023, a drug called amantadine. So this then became a four-arm study. And we have stage two interim analysis for the first two treatments, amantadine and trazodone, occurring in September. And again, we'll be looking at ALS FRS change. And this time we'll be looking at information from 100 participants per arm followed up for 12 months or more. So in addition to looking at ALS FRS, the co-primary outcome measure of this trial is also survival. And we are looking at a number of secondary outcome measures, including cognitive and behavior functioning, breathing functioning, quality of life, and also general physical functioning. So MND Smart is really a national community. Uh, we have launched in 20 sites now across the United Kingdom, and we purposely opened in major academic centers, but also in smaller areas and in regional areas. So we've recruited people from remote islands all the way to urban inner city areas because we wanted to achieve equity of access for people living with motor neuron disease ALS. And historically, only six of our sites had previously run trials for people with MND. So we felt it was very important to increase access and opportunities. This is a picture of our team in Edinburgh, which is the main lead site for the trial and very much designed with people living with MND at the center of our, our thinking. This is a picture of the national team now. We have, as I said, 20 sites across the UK, and this is our team of nurses, doctors, um, and also some people living with MND who participate in the trial design. This is a meeting we had in Edinburgh just last month. So MND has, uh, SMART has been co-produced very closely alongside people living with MND. We had open consultation and feedback with uh, people living with the condition and their relatives. The overwhelming majority of people uh, demanded access to trials. They drew comparisons with cancer and said really the opportunity to participate in trials should be the standard of care given the poor prognosis. So we designed inclusive trial criteria we also avoided drugs in tablet form, so liquid wherever possible. And we reduced the number of appointments to clinic. This is even before COVID. We arranged to follow people up by video conferencing uh, for their assessments. And we deliver the medication to people's homes by courier. Really, our feeling was that no individual with MND should have to travel past multiple hospital sites to access a trial. And that's why we've opened at as many sites as possible across the country. And what we're working on now is more remote data capture using apps uh, and perhaps looking at other digital outcome measures like wearable devices. People living with MND at the heart of all of our planning. We have an active uh, group of patients who shape the trial design, help with regulatory approvals. They sit on our steering committees to help with our funding applications. So people who understand the condition are very important in everything that we do. So we launched in February 2020, and uh, since that time, uh, really uh, over 2,000 people in the UK, which has a population of about 65 million, have uh, registered their interest in participating in the trial. And we have, despite the global pandemic, uh, managed to recruit now at a rate of 15 participants a month and have recruited just under 600 people with this uh, condition. And we continue striving for equity of access, regardless of where people live, regardless of their socioeconomic status or their ethnicity. So I mentioned um, the uh, trial design. Uh, the fourth arm was launched in April 2023. And one of the major efficiencies of this was at that time, we had already a number of sites established. We didn't have to start from the beginning again. Uh, we could just launch the drug simultaneously across all of the sites without having to have a, a major delay. And stage two interim analysis will occur uh, for memantine and trazodone uh, next month. How do we choose our drugs? Well, 
There are a number of high throughput drug screening assays that we have in our laboratories that focus on the misaccumulated TDP43 protein that occurs in motor neuron disease. Also looks at the effect of drugs on supporting nerve cells like astrocytes and cells called microglia. So we can screen many, many thousands of drugs at scale in a dish, and that leads to some evidence as to whether these drugs might be effective in clinical trials. We also have an approach where we look at a systematic review of all of the scientific literature to see if any of these drugs are effective in other neurodegenerative conditions that share common pathways like dementia, Parkinson's, uh, and uh, multiple sclerosis. There are other diseases where these drugs might have shown benefit and also to be safe, and we can then prioritize them for uh, a clinical trial. The first two drugs that we introduced are repurposed drugs. So these are drugs that have been shown to be safe and effective in other conditions with a biological basis to test in people with MND. So memantine is a drug used for treating uh, people with Alzheimer's, but has a mechan mechanism of action that might be neuroprotective in MND. And there is indeed evidence from previous animal studies. And trazodone is an antidepressant, which again has evidence from uh, preclinical models to suggest it would be beneficial to test in people with MND. <clears throat> so amantadine, just to give an example, was selected after extensive review of the literature of what was safe and effective in other neurodegenerative conditions. We also did network and pathway analysis, looking at the pathways that um, are known to be affected in motor neuron disease. And amantadine has good overlap with disease proteins that are likely to modify this disease network. I mentioned the phenotypic assays for drug screening. And then ultimately, an expert panel will look at the pros and cons of testing each drug, how safe it is, what the route of administration is, how easy it is to manufacture, and then these drugs are taken through to trial. So what difference are we making? This is just some feedback from some of our participants. And the overwhelming sense is that there is now a sense of hope, a hope of contributing to understanding more about these drugs in this condition. Also, an understanding that the medication may not help them today, but the findings will help people in the future. Also, a general sense that people are now having the opportunity to meet with healthcare professionals on a more regular and structured basis throughout their uh, illness. In addition to making a difference for our patients, it's made a difference for the doctors who are looking after patients. Previously, uh, they have been used to breaking bad news and then ultimately supporting people through uh, with no hope. But now they feel as though uh, there is a sense of uh, uh, changing the positive message that can be offered by participating in a drug trial. So we work very closely with, uh, with patients living with motor neuron disease and they have advised us they will participate in trials of any drugs that may slow, stop or reverse this disease regardless of their side effects and uh, need to monitor for safety. So in the future, when we introduce new treatments, we're going to be more adventurous and have drugs that may require uh, some blood tests for monitoring and might have more effects. Side and there are a number of drugs that we're uh, considering that have compelling data from our human discovery platforms. And what we're working through now is that some of these drugs are very expensive, so we have to think about the costs. Also, some of these drugs may not be available as liquid, so we have to think about the different routes of administration, and then also how we can administer them safely and how we might monitor uh, for safety as well. So we're working on a number of protocol amendments to accommodate uh, these sorts of treatments in the future. Now, we've had a number of participants who've been followed up for many, many months now, and this allows us to support a longitudinal bioresource. So we've been collecting blood samples from all of our patients at baseline, but then every six months through the duration of the study. And this is a very powerful bioresource now for the discovery of new biomarkers that might then act as outcome measures in trials. We also have a high rate of uh, autopsy, so around 20% of people uh, may sign up for an autopsy so we can do some studies to see what effect the drug has had actually directly on the brain. I mentioned before that we're very keen to think about digital data capture to allow people to be followed up at home. And this includes 
uh, the application of questionnaire-based assessments at home or also monitoring their functioning uh, by measuring their speech or their movement. So as we go along, we have published our protocols, our statistical analysis plan, and how we have selected our drugs. And I think it's very important that, that there's open science and that any findings are presented in an in a, in a open and quick way for people to understand what we're finding out. We've secured funding for the next five years um, from various charities. And one thing that we'll be focusing on now also is combinations of treatments. So we know that from cancer medicine and infectious diseases, that sometimes you need more than one drug taken in combination to be effective. And we think that's an approach that might work in motor neuron disease. So that was a, a very quick summary of what we're doing in the trial. We have a number of uh, ways of following our progress uh, through social media, uh, on Twitter and on our webpage. Uh, MND Smart is now the largest trial for motor neuron disease in the UK. Uh, it provides a good example of interdisciplinary working uh, from a, people from a range of disciplines, statisticians, drug discovery and cancer. We have broad inclusion criteria and we've designed the whole study together with people with MND. And this has supported high rates of recruitment, retention and data completion. I mentioned we have a bio resource that supports reverse translation and we have significant opportunities for innovating digital outcome measures. And really the trial is an efficient platform for definitive testing of a number of drugs to identify those that will improve outcomes for people with MND. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Powell. Uh, okay, that was really interesting and really exciting, of course. Uh, it, it is certainly a, a very innovative design to speed up the, the process of, of, of uh, discovering new, new drugs that can be effective for, for our patients. So uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, here in the ALS Association of Argentina, we've been talking to other representatives from other platforms, ALS or MND platforms around the world. And of course, they, they are all similar in many ways, but different in other ways. So for example, <clears throat> we talked to Dr. Paganoni from the Healy platform in the US, and uh, she explained to us that, that the, the Healy platform is more of a phase two environment in, in some way, because they what they do is, is speeding up the, the process of, of, of phase two, which is usually lengthy, right? And then once they they can they can establish that that drug uh, uh, may be effective and may be promising, they they deliver the product back to the the pharmaceutical company to start a, a phase three process. Um, as far as I understood from your presentation, MND Smart is more of a definitive uh, phase three. Uh, environment. That's what I understood from your presentation. Can you explain a little bit more on that? Yeah, thank you. That's correct. I think so that you're right. There are a number of platform trials at the moment. We all have slightly different approaches. Our outcome measures are ALS FRS, which is the clinical rating scale, but also survival. And therefore it is a definitive uh, phase three outcome measure. The implications for that though are that the trial duration is significantly longer. So we're not following people up for just 24 weeks. We're following them up for the duration to get the survival data as well. So we have interim analysis points that allows a drug to stop if it's ineffective before. But if a drug is showing benefit, there's a real efficiency to this system to just have those participants continue under follow-up until there's more ALS FRS data at 18 months, but then also at that point, some definitive survival data. So it is a phase... Uh, three trial and partly the regulators differ in what they would view as a benchmark for licensing. So the Medicines Health Regulatory Authority in the UK has a slightly different threshold and a bar from the FDA in the US, for example. Um, but that's the approach that we've taken because we feel that uh, this trial allows efficient stopping of drugs early but that if a drug does show some benefit at that early stage, you don't want to start a trial right from the beginning again and then have to do all of the survival analysis on a, on a new population. Right. 
Okay, clear. Thank you for that. And what about the results? What, what, what have been the results so far for memantine and trazodone? And when can we expect future results? Yes, so the memantine and trazodone arms passed stage one analysis. And that was when 50 participants completed six months or more in each arm. But at that point, we just know that the drug continues through to testing. The next interim analysis point will occur next month, which is when 100 participants will have completed 12 months or more in each study. And we'll find out, we don't know the data yet, we'll find out at that point if these drugs have passed that hurdle or not. If they have uh, passed that hurdle, we'll continue to collect 18 months of ALS FRS data. If they have failed, that's actually a definitive stop. We know that those drugs are ineffective. We can publish the data, park that, no one needs to retest those drugs again, and then we'll bring new drugs in. So part of this design is that we understand that there will be ineffective treatments. Um, as yet, we haven't had a definitive result from the trial, so we can't report on, a, on, a, on anything at the moment. Excellent, thank you. Um, so taking you out of the MND Smart uh, item, um, uh, I, was, I was wondering, uh, uh, because you are a, a researcher in Europe, <laughs> or in the UK, but, 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 uh, but next to Europe. And it, when we talk about current treatments that are approved around the world, uh, there, uh, we, we, have, uh, we have had a couple of new treatments in the last few months that are approved in, in North America, like Tofersen and AMX0035. Uh, some years ago, we also had a Darabon, uh, in, in some countries, Argentina is one of them. The, the Darabon is already approved in Argentina, but always the EMA uh, seems to be stricter in terms of, of criteria for, for approval. And I, I must say, because we, we talked to, to some other uh, researchers uh, from the UK and Europe, uh, um, Many of them tend to be supportive of, 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 of these criteria uh, because of many reasons in terms of uh, uh, making sure that we, 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 we get a, a, a treatment, a new treatment that is, that is actually effective uh, in a significant way. Um, so wh what is your take on, on, on the EMA criteria and 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 what, what could be the message for, for future approvals in, in, in Europe and the UK? Yes, so I think that the regulators uh, differ globally in the thresholds that they set for licensing of new drugs. That is true. And I think that the EMA and the UK regulatory authority would like more definitive data on survival than some other regulators have for some of the approvals. Now, there's a balance because the bar is very, very low. So in the UK, the only licensed treatment we have is Renuzol. That only extends life by two to three months. So any incremental approach to that, uh, I can understand absolutely why people living with MND and their families want access to those treatments and equitable access if other people are receiving them elsewhere in the, in the world. One of the key things, obviously, is the, the survival and the morbidity of being on the treatment uh, and side effects. So uh, people may be living longer, but are they having a better quality of life? Are the side effects better? And I think all of these things are important to measure in trials as well. Um, so Tofferson had some exciting results at uh, the six-month report. I think everyone is very excited to see the one-year extension open label data, uh, and also the survival data, the quality of life data for those individuals. Um, there are some treatments that have a different route of administration, so that's an intrathecal treatment. It's more labor intensive, there are more uh, costs and side effects associated with them. So I think uh, the regulators need to understand the devastating nature of this disease. They need to understand that the landscape is such that there are very few effective treatments at the moment, and they need to, they need to uh, review all the medicines with the data in, in, in that context. It's not just a case of set a survival threshold this high 
and it must cross that bar to make it available. I think they have to understand <coughs> that there's a desperation amongst people living with this condition for urgent new treatments. Um, so I think actually we're probably at a tipping point at the moment because of the number of trials that are coming through, um, that the frustration that people have uh, is understood, but there will be new treatments that come on that are more effective than these ones that we discussed that have been licensed elsewhere. And when they come on, I think there is a requirement for regulators to be able to review the evidence quickly and make decisions quickly and make the drugs available quickly as well. Thank you, that was very clear. And having said that, uh, how, how do you see uh, the, the, the ongoing phase three confirmation trials that are uh, taking place in, in Europe or, or about to take place in Europe for both uh, the oral form of Edarabone and AMX0035? Yeah, I think it's important that those phase three trials report in a timely way. And if they show a positive signal, that those drugs are reviewed by the regulators and uh, have early access, really, I think. The, the, the side effect profile, my understanding is that there's very little side effect profile for those medicines. Uh, and so I think we just need to see the definitive data. Um, I think that's the key thing. There's, there, there are many trials that report headline data at conferences or uh, information on social media, but people would want to see the final publication and want to see what is the actual statistical benefit in that population that's been studied in. And this is a kind of one of our classic questions, uh, considering that, that most of our audience is from Latin America. Latin America is one of the regions that are not at the front line of ALS research. Uh, we might be at the front line of other diseases, but not as much uh, for the case of neurodegenerative diseases. So many people here in, in our region are very eager to participate in, in clinical trials, but as, as you know, this is difficult because of distance, because of uh, costs, and because many other factors. So what would be your message for the people outside uh, the, the, the usual areas where, where research that takes place, which is North America and, and Europe. Yeah, I think you raise a very important point. So I think research should be more generalizable. The study populations should be more diverse. Certainly within the UK, with this trial, we've worked very hard to open at sites that allow diverse socioeconomic and ethnic, ethnic background. Um, I think there is a much uh, an unmet need globally for collaboration in, in trials uh, with centers that are multinational, not just in, in one country. Um, I think at the moment there are some regulatory hurdles that stop that from occurring, which need to be addressed. So it, it would be ideal to have uh, patient population testing the same medicines in North America, South America, Asia, Europe, uh, you know, and I agree with you entirely that the that the complex complexion of participants in research in general uh, is is very homogeneous, and that needs to be expanded. Um, I don't have an answer as to how quickly to solve that solution, but I think one thing that does occur uh, is that there is a lot more conversation going on between uh, leaders in the fields from different areas. Um, so for example, I'm very happy to be speaking about MND Smart to you today and sharing what we're doing in the UK. Um, and I think in that way that the awareness of these trials increases and allows international collaboration as well um, in the future. Excellent, thank you so much for that. Okay, uh, Dr. Pala, I think that's all for today. That, that's been really helpful and, and really hopeful too for, for our community. It's good to to hear uh, news and updates on, on, on these uh, innovative designs for, for, for clinical trials. Uh, we, we really support this idea. We really see that platforms may be one of the ways to, to speed things up so, so our patients can have uh, new and effective treatments sooner uh, and, and faster than, uh, than, than before. So thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, I want to say, to, to send my, uh, our greetings to, to your people in, in Edinburgh 
and and we hopefully we'll see you around probably i don't know maybe in basel switzerland by the end of this year we're going to be there uh maybe some you or some of your team are going to be there too so hopefully that is the case and again thank you so much for this uh, this con educational contribution and for taking some time of your we know uh, for your uh, from your very busy schedule well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's always lovely to, to speak about what we're doing and thank you for the interest that you've shown as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Powell.